Welcome to Stock Tales, everyone. It's Ali Coram here. And joining me today, we've got Richard Moglin. He's a co-founder at TraderLine, head of education there. Does a lot of great videos with traders on YouTube. And I am so happy to have you here today. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me on, Ali. And uh, yeah, always a pleasure. And I was telling you backstage, I, I think you've done a fantastic job with YouTube. So thanks so much for inviting me. Yes. All right. Well, uh, likewise, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, happy to have you on the show and looking forward to talking about a couple of your recent trades. But taking a step back, we'll be talking about your trading style, some of the rules that you use, and with all the wealth of knowledge that you have uh, from all of your interviews with the best traders out there, what you've picked up for them. We're going to get really specific and drill down some of the exact rules I, I'm hoping to get, at least, uh, from you of what you've really put into practice with all of that knowledge that you've learned. So uh, starting off, just super quick thoughts first on the market and where you think we're at, where you're at. Uh, sounds like you're still making some buys, but I'm assuming, you know, being very careful with your exposure level right now. Yeah, right now, if you just take a look at uh, a chart of the NASDAQ composite or really any of the indexes, we're below the majority of the moving averages, a declining 50-day, 200-day moving average. And for me, that tells me to just be patient. I mean, right now we're in a corrective phase. There's not many stocks working. And obviously, William O'Neill teaches that three out of four stocks are going to follow the, mm -hmm. the general trend of the market. So uh, you don't want to fight the market and try to shoot for that 25%. The odds just aren't with you. Uh, so right now, I'm, I'm very selective with um, my trades. I'm, I'm trying to be you know, mm -hmm. as less active as possible, really trying to wait for those good setups. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, today, a good setup that I found as well as kind of a, you know, not an optimal trade. So I think it's a good show of like, you know, looking in the moment when you're trying to find a trade, you might actually force things. So be patient in this type of environment. And uh, the the next new uptrend, the next next amazing bull market will happen. So we just have to mm -hmm. be patient. So uh, those are my general thoughts. Yeah, definitely. And I'm right there with you. I mean, and even in this uh, current environment, if you make a trade that doesn't ultimately work out. I mean, it says more about the type of market that we're in than, you know, if it's checking a lot of boxes off. So, you know, don't be too hard on yourself, Richard. Not yeah, You're not thanks. gonna get every trade perfect. Um, so this is, of course, my kind of take on a happy hour with colleagues. So we gotta get some fun fun stuff in here. So it's, it's about to be the 4th of July week and you have any fun plans? Just, uh, I think, hanging out with some friends. I think we're worth looking at doing a hike up here. I'm in, I'm in Seattle, so there's some really nice uh, parks and, and stuff around me. So, yeah, looking for, forward to getting outside and enjoying the nice weather that's finally uh, arriving here to Seattle. It's been kind of a rainy spring here, but uh, looking forward to getting outside and enjoying that, uh, enjoying that sun finally after this winter. Awesome. Yeah, I, I have some family in town from Texas. I'm in North Carolina, so we're nice. all going to kind of get together. It's it's weird, you know, growing up, we never had like family reunions or any, anything like that. But last year we, we did kind of an unofficial, it's not like an official thing, but apparently 4th of July is kind of when we're, we're all deciding to get, get together. So that's kind of fun. So I'm doing that. Okay. So I have a question for you, Richard, you've interviewed, like I've said, so many traders, so many amazing top-notch traders out there, but you know, I, you know, we're a little on the younger side. So I'm just curious who has been your favorite like younger trader to interview, maybe, you know, like thirties, maybe early forties. I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, and yeah, everybody who I've traded, I, I've learned so much from, I think on the younger side of things, a lot of the the traders who I've interviewed who were doing really well in the U S investing championship in, in 2020. Um, I think those, those were really enjoyable interviews. Matt Caruso, such a nice guy. You get, you guys have had him on IBD live, um, as well as the podcast. He's awesome. Um, I think um, someone who I always enjoy talking with is Ryan Pierpont, also one of the best performers in, in that contest, the U.S. Investing Championship, not only in 2020, but also in 2021. And uh, he, he's, uh, he keeps it super casual. Um, I, think he, <laughs> I think he described uh, technical analysis as, you know, taking out our crayon box and marking up the ch charts like kids. So, uh, yeah, always, always fun talking with him. And he's got such a great perspective. And all these guys are incredibly humble yeah. and, and and giving with their their information. So, um, yeah, I think those are a few names. But really, mm -hmm. I've gotten amazing things out of every single interview that I've done. I, I feel really lucky of to course. get the chance to sit down with these guys and, and um, you know, whatever their age, th there's something to learn yeah. from them. 
Very, very well said. Uh, I just wanted to give like a little moment for, you know, those who are carrying on the tradition, picking up the torch, recognizing as we all do the great legacy of so many of the fantastic traders, William and Neil, of, of course, in, included, but many others as well, that we aim to honor in a sense of, you know, everything that they've uncovered for us and, and laid the groundwork for. But, you know, there, I, I like that a little shout out to those carrying on the tradition. Okay. So another thing that uh, you're really good at, in addition to all of those amazing YouTube videos is on Twitter, you have a great following and great at interacting with your audience there. And you like posting a lot of um, quotes from investors. So do you have one like in your, in your back pocket, what's your favorite go-to investing quote? Ooh. Uh, yeah, there, there's so many good ones. Um, I, I think, I think, uh, some of my favorite traders, just, just thinking back, uh, Nicholas Darvis, Jesse Livermore, in addition to William O'Neill, um, I think my favorite O'Neill quote, since this is a, you know, IBD related podcast is, um, I think, uh, I, I'm going to butcher the, the original. Oh, it's okay. Quote, you some, know, just add, yeah. you know, just kind of paraphrasing. That's yeah. Funny. You know, uh, basically what seems high usually goes higher and what seems low and cheap usually goes lower. I think that's, that's something that's counterintuitive to a lot of people um, just starting out the stock market. They want to buy those deals, those stocks that have fallen 50%. But in reality, you know, the trend usually continues. And we, we saw that in 2020, things went a lot higher than we thought possible. Then finally, when we had those late stage bases, those base breakout failures, late stage base failures, uh, things really turned. And, and I don't think anybody expected Netflix, Facebook, yeah. Roku, um, all these stocks that are, you know, blue chips to fall as far as they as they did. So I think that's a really important quote that I, that I completely butchered, but it's a really important no. point to, to, to remember. That was great. I, I think so, too, especially right now, because there are a lot of stocks with a lot of promise that maybe it's too early. We really need to see them making making more progress first to prove to us that they are worthy of our consideration right now. So many stocks in those downtrends. So, yeah, keep it simple. Look for uptrends. So very well said there, Richard. OK, so now uh, let's talk about some of the trading tips that you've gotten from all of the amazing investors that you've spoken with. Uh, could you tell us, like, maybe, maybe in terms of a, a setup that you really like, what would be something, you know, because I want this to be actionable for our audience. What's some, you know, what's a setup out there that they should uh, keep an eye out for or a characteristic of yeah. a stock that you think is important to share? Yeah, I, I think one that I learned very early on, I, I was lucky enough to, to speak with Jim Ropel, who, who's a hedge fund manager. He's, he's always on IBD Live and all that. Um, what he really looks for, and and I think he said, I don't remember the percentage, but a, a really large amount of his biggest winners of all time um, have started from this particular setup, and that is their earnings gap up. So maybe we can bring up an example of, of Fastly or Twilio back in 2020. UPST had a good example uh, last year. Uh, when a stock breaks out of a sound base on enormous volume, you know, super high volume, five times the the 50 day moving average, that's really telling. That's telling you that something significant has changed with how large institutions, mutual funds, hedge funds are viewing the prospects of a particular stock. And it can just be the start of amazing moves. Uh, DocuSign, another example, I think yeah. in 2019, it, it had a, a huge earnings gap up. And and then obviously it was a huge winner in 2020 as well. But, and, and Tesla, I think as well in, in 2019, that huge move where, um, I don't know if it went up 150, 200% in just a few months, that all started from an earnings gap up. And it might seem scary because, you know, <laughs> there's this huge gap and, and uh, you don't, it's hard to manage risk, but even if you wait a little bit and wait for the stock to settle down, tighten up again, form some type of flag or pull back into the 21 EMA, that's often a stock that you want to pay attention to and look for that setup after this characteristic yeah. occurs because it can lead some, to some amazing moves um, if the market is cooperative. This really, right. you know, it works best when the market is trending above the 21 EMA. Um, but off, if we do see a lot of these stocks start to have this characteristic, that could be a sign that the overall market conditions are changing a little bit and improving. So I think this is a great setup for people to study. Um, I've done a little bit of Python work to, to go back and study a few of these large gaps and what leads to their strong moves. And 
basically I'm looking for a strong closing range on that day because mm-hmm. sometimes we see a stock gap up and it looks like they're going to be, you know, a super strong earnings gap up like this, but right. then it closes all the way at the lows yeah. or, or even fills the gap. And that's not really what you want to see. You're looking mm-hmm. for pure power and sustained buying that day, ideally closing pretty much at the high. And yeah. the best case scenario is not only do the buyers step in that first day, but the next day and the day after that, we see repeated high volume um, strong days suggesting that institutions are really trying to accumulate that stock. So I think this is a, a really good characteristic to look for. Yeah. Okay. So, the, and that's what I was going to ask you. When, when are you buying? If you're seeing that, okay, this is likely like it's going to have a strong close. Are you getting in that day? Are you waiting to see how it, how it trades the following couple of sessions waiting for a pullback? Does it depend, you know, what, what is the ideal entry for one of these earnings gaps for you? Yeah, I, I've spoken to a few different traders. A lot of people trade similar setups to this, and they all they all have a little bit of a different methodology. Some people like to try to enter on that day one where they're using the opening range on a five minute bar or mm-hmm. a fifteen minute bar and try to enter through that high. Yeah. Uh, personally, I like to wait maybe until the second day and look for a, a move through the high volume close that that first day set. So mm-hmm. that basically becomes my pivot point. And hopefully I can manage risk at, at the day's lows or something similar, trying to manage that risk as tightly as possible. Right. But, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. But even if you don't see a quick setup like that, even if you wait, you know, a week, a week or two, and the stock kind of calms down, becomes tighter, um, you know, forms of volatility contraction, that's really when I like to step, step in. And often that lines up when it's pulling back into one of its moving averages um, and even the anchor view at from that high volume gap up day. So that's mm-hmm. kind of what I look for. I think my sweet spot is either that second day or waiting for it to calm down, kind of set up again, set up in a tight volatility contraction. That's mm-hmm. why I like to uh, look for an entry. Fantastic. Uh, now, something that I think might be educational for the audience as well is, you know, this is kind of the one scenario that goes against what we always say. And I know this is something with you too, don't buy extended. It's something that you've studied in your post analysis, same for me too. I would uh, have been better off buying closer to either a 50 day or a 21 day moving average, even if it was a stock breaking out in an eight buy zone. Uh, but this is like the one exception to that. So how do you manage risk for that? Are you, you know, tighter stop, position size, a little bit of both? I mean, it sounds like, you know, using whatever day's low that you're keying off of, that'll help make sure that your position size is within check. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Ross told me a story where uh, either he or another PM um, back in the 2000s was asking about these gap ups and whether it's extended or something like that. And O'Neill said something like, no, this is the most bullish sign you can see. So this type of setup, even though it may feel extended, as I as I mentioned, um, it's it's telling you that institutions are really, you know, mm-hmm. fighting each other for shares. So it, it, in that sense, you know, you want to pay attention to it. In terms of managing risk with these, um, like I said before, and as you mentioned, I'm usually using the low of a day, low of the day, or an an intraday spot to manage risk. Um, mm-hmm. Looking at the 65 minute time frame. And usually my stop losses are within three, three and a half percent. So I'm a little bit tighter than the classic, you know, seven, eight percent that O'Neill says in his book. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of the traders who I've interviewed, they like those tighter stops. They're willing to yeah. be stopped out a few times um, to, you know, give themselves more and more shots at a particular stock. Um, and uh, that way they can size up a little bit, still keep risk in check. Uh, but when that setup does finally work, it can pay for all those smaller losses. So I'm definitely one to, to use a little bit tighter stops. I'm not using 1%, 0.5% stops, but <laughs> I like to keep it about three, three and a half percent. Yeah. Um, that gives it a little bit of wiggle room, but also make sure that my stops are pretty tight. Exactly. And so you mentioned using a 65 minute chart. Is that your go-to intraday chart when you're, when you're looking for buys? Yeah, uh, I would say I would say it is. I don't want to go too much lower to that than that because there is a lot of noise. Um, I wouldn't suggest looking at five minute, one minute chart, especially if you're a position trader, swing trader. Uh, that's you know that's too much. There's too much volatility down there. Uh, but a 65 minute time frame I found is really really useful for the swing trading position traders if they're trying to kind of narrow in on those those specific buy points. Uh, because if you can buy at a volatility contraction on a 65 minute time frame. Um, at a spot where you know there's a pivot on a daily chart, you're looking at the higher time frames for the pivot. You always want to be, you know, buying with the trend. But if you can 
look for a specific area on a daily chart or weekly chart and then zero in on a 65 minute time frame that just helps you keep everything a little bit tighter and allows you to manage risk a little bit better as well okay great all right so you mentioned swing trading versus position trading so i think that begs the question richard is what style of trader would you say you are yeah i'm, I'm gonna kind of go in between uh, i would say i'm a little bit of a hybrid um i think you know after this correction ends and and there's a sustained bull market i'll try to hold those stocks for a little bit longer uh you'd maybe use the 50-day moving average a little bit more uh, but I think for my style, I I really like the 21 exponential moving average as my guardrail. Um, and usually that doesn't allow me to hold through bases. It kind of kind of keeps the trend as it goes from base to base. Um, so I would say I'm a little bit more on the swing trading side of things, but still a little bit in between. And I'm flexible to what the market conditions are. So right now, you know, we're not in an environment where stocks are going to be trending for a month, two months. So you got to shorten it up a little bit and uh, take take profits a little bit earlier or just be a little bit tighter with your risk management in general. Exactly. And I mean, I feel like there's a, there's a little bit of a dance, right? There's there's definitely something to be said of you can't just change your style when you feel like it because you're not going to you're not going to learn if you, you don't have consistent rules. But at the same time, I feel like there has to be a little bit of wiggle room to know what type of market you're in. And then maybe you are leaning more into swing trading or you're leaning more into position trading. Yeah, I would agree. And so in 2020, I was looking at my stats and my average winner was like 12%, 13%. My average loss was like four, four and a half percent. But then the next year in 2021, I think I ran my stats um, halfway through the year and my average winner was like eight, nine percent. So when conditions change and your average gain is decreasing, you have to adapt and, and you know, tighten your stops a little bit so you can keep that good risk reward um, and, you know, make sure you've got a positive expect expectancy, because if you don't have a positive expectancy, you shouldn't be trading. You don't have an edge. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's important to bend with the conditions a little bit. Uh, but, you know, stay consistent with your views on the market. And and, um, you know, I, I think bending and adapting the conditions is what you should be doing as a, as a trader. Um, you can't expect you can't force your will on the market yeah. You have to take kind of what it gives you. Yeah, totally agree. All right. So next, um, let's talk about some recent trades that you made, Richard. How about that? So yeah. the first one we can talk about is UTHR. And you're you're still in this one, actually, right? Yes, I am. And I, I was just on the IBD podcast. Uh, and I think that day was when I, I bought the stock. So if you take a look at the chart, um, I, I don't know the particular day, but it was the day after we had a nice breakout through the 21 EMA. And then we had, uh, yes, exactly. Th that first day that you that you mentioned there was the day I bought it. Uh, we had a retest of a kind of a consolidation pivot here. And I bought as it undercut the kind of 224 pivot and then reconfirmed to the upside. Uh, my average cost was 224.7. Um, it acted well, closed strong. And this is an overall area that's been acting super well. Healthcare, mm -hmm. biotech, that's pretty much the leading group right now, if we if we had to name one. Uh, China's also strong. Solar is decent, not quite as good. Uh, but this has kind of been the area to look for longs if you're going to trade long in this market. Um, and today, actually, we had a nice upside reversal. Um, I added through... Uh, 235.89 uh, today, another 3% position on top of my existing 5% position. And I'm looking for kind of a continued move to the upside. I'll probably add a little bit more if we do get a breakout through kind of 240 and hopefully a breakout through that those ultimate highs that we set um, about five days ago. So this has been a stock that's acting well. You can see it's holding that shortest term moving average here and uh, nice action today considering you know where the market is i yeah. mean this this stock is forming higher lows as the market is forming lower lows if you zoom out to a weekly or monthly chart we're right near all-time highs uh that's pretty much as strong as you can ask for when the market you know looks like it like it is yeah. when we're in a correction yeah this stock is saying what bear market and i think even you in a way of course you're managing your you know taking a step back managing that entire portfolio knowing where we are in the market but i mean to be buying a stock off of the 10-day line you know in a, in a like a, a bear market but this is this is the one bright spot right and you know how to control your risk yeah uh that ad if it takes out today's low i'm out of that ad. uh the rest of the position i'm i'm managing versus the 21 ema which is already above my cost um so that's it's really important to manage risk especially in this hub environment where stuff moves pretty quick you know the fed comes out with some news 
we we dropped two percent. So you got to be quick in this market and and make sure you're managing managing everything, managing your position, managing your risk. That's the number one important thing. Um, and right now, I'm not very overly exposed. I'm very focused on this stock, just a few others. And um, you know, until things really change and we see more leadership develop, uh, Ross always tells me whispers, whispers in my ear: watch the leaders, watch the leaders, watch the leaders. Right now, kind of biotech you know, some yeah. China names, all that. There's not much out there. And until that really broadens and, and whole themes develop, I'm not going to become super aggressive. Um, and, you know, we're so far off, off um, we're so far below moving averages right now in the general market. We've got a lot to work to do before we can really, you know, dive in and be as aggressive as we were in 2020 and, and the other years. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I uh, totally agree. I mean, this is the area they're flexing those leadership muscles right now, no doubt. And let's also take a, a look at uh, Solar Edge SEDG. But before we talk about this one, so a little bit earlier, you mentioned, you know, looking at your stats for the years, your winners versus losers. How often would you say that you're conducting that post analysis? Yeah, I should do it more. I would say uh, I, I'm, I'm right now do it. We're, we're coming up at the half year point. So I'll probably mm-hmm. Uh, after the conference uh, next year, uh, n- next week, which is going to take up a lot of my time, I think I'll really dive into my stats this year. But I try to do it at least every six months. I think that gives you a good frame of mind and, and a reference point in terms of where you're at. But also, you kind of get a sense of how you're doing it. But you know, there's nothing like popping out the Excel sheet, putting all your stats in, or using TradeSync or one of these services, and and seeing the truth about your training. Because I think the first time that people do it, people are very afraid. Uh, you know, uh, they <laughs> might see. The truth about the training, which can be ugly, it could be good, depending on where you're at. Uh, but it can only help you. It can it can only help inform how you should be trading um, mm-hmm. and how aggressive you can be. So I think it's a very good thing and a very essential thing as well. Exactly. Yeah. Especially if you're an active trader, and of course it depends on the environment. You may be trading more in some periods than others, you know, depending on the market cycle and all of that. But it's it's hard to remember every trade that you've made <laughs> in detail oh, yeah. if, you, if you're an active trader. So maybe, you know, I uh, thinking that you know, it, maybe this was in my case, too. Oh, maybe thought I did a little, a little bit better than I actually did. Um, but no, ripping off the band-aids is good and it may and it makes you better. Um, so, yeah definitely with you recommend that. So let's take a look at solar edge. So uh, solar stocks, this is another area that has uh, shown some promise and uh, relative outperformance uh, amid all of the destruction, but it, there's you know been some fits and starts, and this group is quite volatile. But you know when they when they can get moving, they can really get moving. Yeah, in 2020, I, I traded this stock ENPH as well, um, and they had really nice moves. Um, but yeah, if you look at uh, yeah, you can see that run in 2020 that you're, we're pointing out right now. But we've pretty much been basing almost since then, and we've had a lot of you know we're, we're going to move up, we're going to break out to all time highs, and we haven't yet. So this yeah. is a group that's volatile. But during this time, during this correction, I'm always just trying to you know try to find those areas of the market that are bucking the overall trend. And this is another one that was forming higher lows versus the rest of the market. And we're, we're right now in a cup and handle. Uh, I My entry was basically on that one day where we tried to break out of a consolidation pivot. I think it's about four days ago. Uh, the next day we completely reversed, stopped me out right there. And I was buying just through that level pretty much, just through that area. And my cost on that was 296.54. Um, and then the next day I got stopped out for, I think, a 2.7% loss, 289.69. So a very quick trade. A lot of my losers yeah. are like that. I either get stopped out that day or the next day or the day after that. And that's how I like it. I want to try to hold my, you know, hold my winners, the socks that are doing well for multiple days um, and ideally weeks and months. And uh, for my losers, I want to get out as quickly as possible so I can either be in cash or kind of, you know, move that money around to a better opportunity. Uh, but this one was moving up the right hand side where we're within that over overall cup and handle moving up the right right hand side a little bit uh this is extremely volatile ali as you said uh, we're gapping up and down a little bit uh but we we had a little bit of tightness against that 200 day moving average a lot of the other moving averages are coinciding there as well and uh we had a nice burst in relative strength and you know it's it's if you look at the overall chart i give it like a c maybe even a d uh but considering the overall environment this is holding up better than most uh, but I much prefer the UTHR chart to this one because we're closer to all-time highs. It's cleaner. There's less gaps. There's, there's less volatility. Uh, but this is a this is a trade that I took, and I yeah I, I would grade it worse than the UTHR trade, uh, just because the overall chart pattern is a little bit weaker. 
Mm -hmm. Well, who knows if it can start move up a little bit, get back above the 200 day line or tighten up a little bit more that could offer another opportunity, but we'll, we'll have to see. And we'll have to see what the market hands us as well. Now we have a question from our audience. This is from Ed and he's saying, uh, can you talk a little bit about the green line breakouts that Dr. Wish refers to? Sure thing. So first of all, Dr. Wish was the, my first uh, mentor in the markets. Uh, he's how I got my start. I, I took a class at the University of Maryland, very, very lucky um, to have taken that class called the Introduction to the Stock Market and Technical Analysis. Dr. Wish has been trading using the cancel methodology for uh, 50 plus years now. He, he's an amazing teacher as well. And he has a setup, what he, which is basically what he calls the green line breakout, where a stock moves up to new all time highs, then rest for at least three months and consolidates under that level. And then a green line breakout is where we finally break through that through that resistance level, um, basically into new all-time highs. And that's extremely bullish. A lot of the greatest moves in history, if you look back on the chart, uh, started from a green line breakout. And uh, you want to see extremely large volume above average volume. And the, the key thing is you want to sell the stock if it closes back below that line. You don't want to see it close back below it. Basically, you want to see it break through that line and continue going, yep. showing that institutions really have a strong appetite for it. Similar to the earnings gap up setup, you want to see large volume um, and continue to move to the upside. So that's pretty much what the green line breakout is. Uh, you know, there, there's been not too many examples recently, but I think, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there haven't been too many green light breakouts recently, but it's a good it's a good setup to learn. If you go back and look at 2020, uh, 2019, you know, there's there's a lot of great, great charts you can study. Any, any that come to mind from 2019 or 2020? Let's see. Um, Putting you on spot. Well, yeah, we can just, uh, I think uh, Netflix had a pretty decent one. If we can take a look at Netflix. Um, sure. If you look at any of the strong movers from 2020, they pretty much all had uh, green line breakouts. My, where am I in 2020? In an okay spot or do I need to go further? Yeah, so or this actually isn't the best example. If we bring up Amazon, I think that was actually into all-time highs. So this one of a, those mega cap techs. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So if we take a look at um, that, the base overall, all, all, all the way on the right hand side, we're on a weekly chart here. But if you go to a monthly, uh, you always want to look at a monthly chart to look for the green lines. OK, uh, so, great. Yep. Good tip. So let's see. So this actually didn't rest for three months. So let's bring up Tesla, actually. Sorry to keep. Uh, no, uh, I, you know, when, you, when you're just, this is, this is happy hour. We're, we're not pre-planning yeah. anything. This is on the fly. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah. So Tesla is actually a pretty good example here. So if you take a look at that first move up here, I, sorry, I can't point to the chart here, but about three monthly bars from the right-hand side. Three monthly bars from yep. the right-hand side. Well, so four actually. So where it made that high, and then we had obviously the correction. Uh, so one bar, so not there, Ali, sorry. Yep, so one I bar to the left that. of that big red bar. One bar to the left, oh yeah, that, so. Yep, yeah. yeah. so that came high. down. Yes, Got exactly. It. So that that high is where you would draw that green line across. Um, and then when mm. it finally breaks through that high, that's what we call the green line breakout. Okay. Yep. So can you give the definition one more time then? Sure, for sure. For audience? So, Absolutely. So you can see there's that prior move up from 2019, where we move up to that bar where we've drawn the the, the red line there. And Got we it. have a move up into new all time highs. And okay. then we rest for at least three monthly bars below that level. And then we have a breakout through that level three months or later. So that that's the definition of, the, of a green line breakout. And obviously, we know Tesla is one of the best performing stocks of, of 2020. Um, and uh, I think everybody probably traded it. Uh, who's in the chat here. But uh, <laughs> yeah, this has been a really tremendous stock. And, you know, maybe it sets up a, another one, but um, we'll we'll have to wait. Interesting. So it's it's kind of like, a, you know, a, a very loose, wide and loose high <laughs> flag type of thing. But we'll just call it, we'll call it a green line breakout. So yeah, perfect. Good stuff. All right, Richard. Well, thank you so much for spending some time uh, this afternoon. And you mentioned the conference coming up. So give us more details on that before we go. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically next week and the week after that, July 9th, 10th, 16th, and 17th, over at the Trader Line YouTube channel, uh, we'll be putting on our annual conference where we'll basically have 27 top traders, U.S. investing champions, um, market historians, uh, amazing you know, educators 
who will be presenting about all different topics related to trading, growth trading specifically. And we have a bunch of people from, you know, the Cancel system. Uh, Justin Nielsen, mm -hmm. as well from IBD, will be presenting. Amy Smith, as well, will, will present as well. And we've got, you know, David Ryan, Jack Schwager, Mark Ritchie II, some, so many amazing, amazing traders who I've interviewed previously or just really admire. Um, and I think it'll be an amazing event. And the best thing is it's 100% free. And uh, to find out more about it, I think you just go over to uh, the TraderLine website and maybe Ali, I can drop the, the yeah. URL, um, you know, later on on Twitter and I'll, I'll tweet that out. Yeah. And uh, if you could put that in the description, that'd be awesome. Exactly. But, yeah. Uh, I was about yeah. to say, we could put it in the description of this video on YouTube. Happy to do that. Sounds good. And sounds like a great lineup. So fantastic. All right. Well, thank you again. Hope you have a happy 4th of July. It was, it was great getting to know you and, yeah. and uh, getting to chat with you today. Yeah. Thanks so much. I, I think you do a great job and ask really great questions. So uh, yeah. Thanks so much for having Likewise. me. Likewise. Hey, I know, you know, you know how hard, how hard it is to be on the other side when you're the one used to asking the questions, right? So yeah, I actually, I think <laughs> I actually well prefer done. to be the, I, I prefer to be the one asking the questions to be honest, yeah. but uh, yeah, I think you do a I great know. job. Well, likewise, it was so awesome getting to chat with you. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you have a fantastic weekend and see you back here next week. Yeah, take care.